master chooses the disciple. Yesterday I spoke on the uniqueness, unique relation that exists between master and disciple. This unique relation between master and disciple is very beautifully exemplified in Bhagavad Gita through the example of Krishna and Arjuna. Both of them they were friends from the very beginning. They were cousins. They, before the war began, Krishna inquires from Arjuna, what does he think? Him to be. What does he think him to be? Had Arjun said that time, you are my cousin, you are my friend, then Arjun would have remained deprived of the message of Krishna. Master-disciple relation is beyond all other relations. And he says, you are my master. You hold the reins of my being, control it and guide it through the thick and thin of the world. Through all the stages of conflict and so. Because he was in a state of inner conflict, the Karma Yoga that Krishna is speaking of in Bhagavad Gita differs significantly from that is being propagated by the so-called learned ones. To understand the message of Krishna, you need a different level of understanding. You have to see the complementary pole within you. With your understanding and that of the priest, you can never understand Krishna and his message. If Arjun had said that you are my friend, then that complementary pole is not created. Seek the master through your prayers. When Meera failed in all her efforts, only then the thirst for the master aroused in her. The thirst, the yearning for the master aroused in her and she was eventually initiated by the master Ravidas. Krishna inquired from Arjun what does he think him to be. Arjun responded that he considers him Krishna as the master, not as a friend, not as a family or anything. Unless this happens, the transformation cannot be possible. The Hindus consider, the Hindu scriptures consider the husband and wife relation at a highest level. At the physical level, they are friends, they are partners in through the life's roots. Beyond this, the husband is supposed to be considered as a master, but it does not happen. Had Arjun considered Krishna as God incarnate, he would have failed in his inner search. Certainly Krishna would have sent him in search of the master. You have to feel within the need for the master that you have reached to a point when there is inner conflict and you are not finding any solutions to it, then master becomes your thirst, your yearning. Had Arjun told him that he is God incarnate, God, Krishna would have sent him in search of the master, inner search. Certainly Krishna would have sent him in search of the master. Verily one can be initiated into inward journey only by the Master. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita is the message given by the Master to his disciple, not a message from God incarnate as normally people think it to be. 
In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's role is that of a master. And the reason of immense popularity of the message contained in the Bhagavad Gita is in its style. The systematic way of explanation, it is a dialogue in the midst of thick and thin of the world and its affairs. It is not a message from the sequestered Himalayan caves. The situation and the context of Bhagavad Gita is and its message is unique. It is a message that is given in the battlefield when the opposing forces are at conflict and therefore have gathered to fight. Unless this situation happens, you cannot seek the master. And then the other part of this is master seeks his own disciple. This is a Sufi parable. First, master has to be a thirst, a yearning within you. That means you are on the borderline, you are right, then master picks you. There is a Sufi parable, when the disciple is ready, the master appears. Indeed, it is the master who chooses the disciple. On its own, the disciple does not have the criteria to know about the master. It is saying that you can recognize your teacher. You can recognize the teacher from what you, not from your own experience because you do not have capabilities to know that this man is a professor of physics. Only because he carries the title you recognize him or others say about him that he is a great master of great professor of physics or chemistry you recognize him. Otherwise on your own you do not have criteria. Had you developed the criteria to recognize the master then you don't need a master. You yourself are capable of recognizing a master and that means you yourself are a master. People go and seek, I am going to look for a good master. I am going to search for, and then they look for who has more prominence, who has more reputation and choose him as master. This is erroneous and this is what everybody is doing. Instead of searching for the master, you have to search whether there is a thirst in you for the master or not. Unless there is a thirst for the lover in you or the beloved in you, you cannot find the beloved. That thirst, that yearning has to be so intense that you cannot live without it. The moment that happens, that means you are ready. You are on the borderline. Arjun had reached to that inner state of inner conflict. He was capable in every way to defeat anyone, a great warrior. But he was not able to conquer himself, his own mind his own ignorance and that is where one has to search that within and the moment you find that within you are on the borderline the master will appear indeed it is the master who chooses the disciple but his choosing always remains indirect he always gives a chance to the disciple to choose the disciple is not even aware that he has already been chosen. But without the master choosing the disciple, there is no way for the disciple to choose the master. His choice comes second. But the master never imposes. He makes it always free for the disciple to choose. That is why it is said he moves indirectly. The reason is clear. The disciple is asleep. As a result, he has no idea who is awake and who is not. He is dreaming. How can he choose then? Whatsoever he chooses is almost certainly going to be wrong. It is a rare coincidence that he may choose the right person simply because he is unconscious and asleep. 
Just think of a room with a few persons sleeping and one person is awake. Now can the sleeping person choose who should wake him up? It is impossible. If they can choose that, then there is no need for the master. So first master creates the situation to wake you up. When you wake up, you tell the person thank you. If they can choose that, there is no need for the master, they can wake up themselves. They are already awake and if you can choose who should wake you up, the whole burden falls on the master to choose whom to wake. The question is whom to wake and not who is to wake. So master wakes you up. The master has certainly ways to know who is very close to awakening. Even if you are watching a few sleeping persons who can decide who is very fast asleep deeply asleep and snoring and who is sleeping very light, a thin layer of sleep and is already on the verge of waking. If somebody can wake him up, it is not going to take time. But there is every possibility if nobody wakes him up, he may slip back into deep sleep, turn over again and pull over the blanket and go back into the sleep. A spiritual sleep is not very different from ordinary sleep. It is just a little more complicated and subtle. It is one of the functions of the masters to choose the disciple, but never to let the disciple know that he has been chosen. That will certainly disturb his independence that is taking away his freedom. As far as the disciple is concerned, the master allows him to think that he is the chooser, that is out of his compassion. Even when the master does something, he makes it appear as if it has been done by the disciple. I have talked about the functions of the masters. And now what are the functions of the disciple? The functions of the disciple are very simple. This can be condensed in one single word, receptivity, non-resistance, availability, saying yes with a full heart. All these can be summed up in one word that is receptivity or yes. There should be no shadow of no. That is the barrier. The master cannot function with a no standing between him and the disciple because he cannot be violent and he cannot destroy the no. It's not that he cannot destroy no, but in destroying no, something else is destroyed within. He cannot remove it because all that will be interfering with the disciple's innermost life. So it is the function of disciple not to put the master in such a situation where he cannot move. His eyes, total and unconditional, give the whole scope to the master to work. And now there is no question of interference. You have allowed the master to be a quest in your being. You are a host and it is one of the greatest joys for the disciple to experience that the master has come within him and he has not resisted. He had allowed him into his inner being. His whole life he has been resisting. He has never allowed anyone a total yes. Not even his lovers, not even his parents, not even his friends, not even his children. To no one has he ever said an unconditional yes. It has always been conditional. 
the wife says to the husband, the husband says to the wife, the lovers, the spouse say to one another, but all that love, all that we see around is conditional. A conditional means mixed with no. And there is a question of if, if it is so, then, if and then, it has never been pure. He has been always guarding himself, not only against enemies, but against friends as well. Look at yourself, look at your life. You are guarding yourself, not against the enemies, but friends too. You operate, you interact with the person with certain restrictions, certain reservations. He has always been guarding himself, not only against enemies, but against friends too. In fact, one does not need to guard himself against enemies too much because they are always far away. They are not that dangerous. Although we consider enemies to be dangerous and keep them away, the real question is of those who are very close to you and to your being. They can stab a knife in your back very easily at any time. You have to be constantly on guard against them. There is an Urdu poem which is very significant. It says, I will take care of my enemies, God, but you please take care of my friends. Very significant. I will take care of my enemies, God, but you take care of my friends. I am not in danger from the enemies. I know them. I am on guard. But about friends, I am confused. And to be on guard with friends is painful, so you take care of me against my friends. It is only with the Master that for the first time you put all your guards away. That is indeed the only function of the disciple, the only thing the disciple has to do. And Arjun removed all the barriers. He did not consider himself to be a warrior. He was a warrior. He did not need Arjun. But until and unless his inner capabilities, inwardly he is ready, there is no conflict, there is no confusion, he cannot enter into the war. Because your valor, your courage, your strength, your intuition is all related to your state of mind. If mind is in a state of confusion, that intellect will not flow, your courage, your determination will not work. Therefore, putting away your guards against the master is the only function of the disciple. It is great and arduous, but single function. It implies everything, openness, readiness, to go wherever the Master is leading him. It is a way of becoming part of the being of the Master and allowing him to be within you. Now there is no fear. In Chishtia order, which is one of the Sufi orders, there was a Master known as Muinuddin Chishti. He is popularly known as Karib Nawaz. His shrine is in Rajasthan in the city of Ajmer and it is also known as Ajmer Sharif, the shrine of the Khwaja Sahib. When he was with his master, his master had nine disciples. One day the master said, they come from a Muslim background. So the master told his disciples that tomorrow morning we will visit the Shiva temple on top of the hill, which is a Hindu temple. 
Temple means statues, the idols, and Muslims are against idol worship. So some of the disciples thought that the master had got crazy, he is going to be idol worshipper, he is carrying us to the temple and we are all from Muslim faith where idol worship is considered profane. So some of the disciples left him even before the journey began. When the next morning, when the journey was to begin, there were about three or four disciples. Muin was one of them. So these people, they thought, except Muin, they thought that maybe the Master is testing us and he may change his mind. They continued. But as they saw the temple being in the site, coming closer and closer, a few of them again disappeared for one excuse or the other. Muin remained and two other disciples remained. When they almost reached at the temple door, the two other disciples just left with an excuse to attend nature's call and saying that they are just coming, they are going to attend nature's call. Muin waited for them. The master said, Muin, come. He said that there I am waiting for those two disciples who went to attend the nature's call. The master said, no, they have gone. They will not come back. You come because he knew Muin had total trust in his master and he goes there. And that particular incident, the master bestowed upon Muinuddin the status of the master. There is an, another incident comes in the life of the Muslim king or emperor Aurangzeb. His father Shah Jahan was a follower of the Naqshbandi master, Naqshbandi Sheikh, Hazrat Khwaza Muhammad Masoom Razila Ta'ala Unu, whose shrine is in Chandigarh, in the outskirts in the place called Sarhin. But in order to reach there, you have to go to Chandigarh and then about 10 months miles or so outskirts of Chandigarh, Sarhind. So the father brought all his sons in front of the master to inquire who will be the next emperor. So the master, Azad Khwaza Muhammad Masoom Razila Ta'ala Ulu, got up from his seat and he asked one by one each one of the king's children to go and sit down on the place where the master was sitting, the master's seat or the chair. As he asked the first son out of reverence, he said that, how can I sit down? That seat is for you. Everyone refused to sit down when it is the chance for the last son, Aurangzeb, who is considered in the history of the Mughal emperor to be the treacherous king. He read a couplet that meant if your master says to dip your janamas, the prayer mat into wine, do so. Because he knows what is right and what is wrong. On your own, you cannot know what is right and what is wrong. This is the meaning of total surrender. And unless this happens, the inward journey the communion between the master and disciple cannot happen. If the two lovers, either of the two, wants to maintain the guard and protect him or herself, there can be no bliss of the male-female relation. 
they have to shed remove all barriers only then something can be possible the two lovers have to stand totally naked in front of one another only then the bliss of that relation is possible so too the disciple has to abandon all his guards all his barriers i'm talking about the mental barriers not the physical mental physical barriers means it is also the mental barrier how can i accept him as a master he is of a different culture different situation and things like these he comes from a different religious background different ethnic background how can i accept him this is the barrier you have not stood naked in front of him means devout of all conditions you have lived your way when people come to the master they want to be with the master but they still want to maintain their upbringing they have been brought up as a hindu or a christian or a muslim they want to maintain that and yet you still want to be with the master that is not possible my grandmother my father's mother she was established in the hindu way of rituals the normal way of going doing prayers fasting or whatever is the way of normal hindu once she asked my mother with a desire to be initiated by the sufi master my grandfather so my mother asked her father that that her mother in law wants to be initiated so he asked one question to be put to her saying that if he asks her to abandon her way of worship the prayers the rituals will she do that if she is ready for that then he can initiate her but my father's mother said that is the way that she has been brought up to do her ritualistic prayers and all these things and she cannot abandon that that was the barrier there was no trust the person is taking you along the inward journey and you want to maintain your own way of life master is not an ornament that you can put on on your will not like a necklace or the bangles or the arm or the bracelet or anything that you can put on at your will and take it off whenever you want unless and until the disciple is ready to abandon all his guards against the master in good journey cannot be possible master cannot be aggressive in that he is very passive he waits for the moment when those barriers are dropped the moment it is dropped something begins to happen and that which happens between the master and disciple brings about transformation in the disciple